So anyways, great pleasure to uh, introduce my very good friend, um, Sam Gooding, Gidding, who's chair of cardiology at, at uh, uh, Nemours. Uh, he went, if I remember right, to uh, uh, Rutgers uh, and then trained uh, in pediatrics at, at uh, Upstate and then did uh, pediatric cardiology, I forget. Ann right? Arbor. Ann Arbor at Michigan University of, of, of uh, Michigan. And then he was on the faculty uh, at uh, Northwestern for uh, uh, many years, and where he and I still to this day have uh, many colleagues in, in, in common, uh, and has been uh, here in Delaware since the uh, year 2000. He's um, chair of, of cardiology and um, professor of uh, pediatrics at uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and he's uh, an expert in, um, uh, in preventive cardiology in young people, a field of truly great uh, importance, and in particular as a world-class expert on familiar hypo familial hypercholesterolemia, which is going to talk about today. Sam, thanks Thank so much you. for coming. Yeah, so um, thanks, Bill. Um, so this is kind of a journey that began, I've done taking care of kids with FH for, since I started in 1986, and, um, but this is a journey that kind of began in, in 2007 or 2009 in Europe when I went over there, participated in the and realized that they were light years ahead of us in terms of genetic diagnosis, screening for FH, and approach. And so you may wonder why I'm talking about a rare genetic disease in an outcomes research um, lecture format, but I think FH has always been a disease model for understanding early coronary disease, and there's lots of questions that have outcomes implications. So as I go through the talk, I'm actually going to talk more about, I'll go through the disease, but in the context of research um, and questions that arise in terms of outcomes. Now, a lot of this actually will be covered in an upcoming AHA statement, which hopefully will be published sometime. It's gotten locked into some AHA um, administrative processes, but uh, that will be out at some point. Um, so what is my hypercholesterolemia? So it's the most common, uh, common dominantly inherited disorder. And it used to be in the textbooks, it'll be one in 500. But in recent genetic studies, it's now actually probably as common one in 200. So it's actually the most common single gene defect that causes premature mortality in the world. Uh, low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels are markedly elevated, not just from birth, but actually in the womb. And it's most frequently due to mutations in genes affecting the LDL receptor, and that's what clears, um, the receptor clears LDL from plasma. And it was actually this discovery of this genetic receptor that led to the Nobel Prize for Brown and Goldstein, and also uh, has been important in terms of drug development. So FH accelerates uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, clinical manifestations often occur in, in homozygotes, can occur in the first decade of life, but often uh, as early as the third or fourth decade of life. And there may be as many as 20 million people with FH worldwide. We actually calculated that there's probably one born a minute uh, worldwide. Less than 10% have been detected, and only 5% are adequately treated. So uh, this is from way back. And at NIH, <clears throat> there was a famous group of lipidologists who basically got the field of lipidology starting in the United States. Neil Stone was one of those. And they had a cohort of families with FH, and what they discovered about this family was that men, uh, about 50% of the men had had heart attacks by the age of 50, <clears throat> and by 60, um, about half of them were dead, and women were similar, and there was just about a 10-year protective <coughs> um, of, of gender, but essentially had a similar natural history. Now, <clears throat> in our 2011 um, NHLBI guideline, we developed this algorithm to think about the life course of exposure to atherosclerosis that begins in the fetus and ends with outcomes. So what we know for FH is that if you have the gene, there's genetic input that the mother actually has high cholesterol, which goes up during pregnancy. That high cholesterol actually is transmitted to the fetus, and you can actually see early atherosclerosis in the placenta mothers uh, with FH. 
This then leads to childhood where environmental exposures can impact um, the uh, risk, but also risk factor screening can occur in the medical office for early identification. This leads to intermediate outcomes such as measures of subclinical atherosclerosis, early atherosclerosis, <coughs> but there's the opportunity for both lifestyle and pharmacologic intervention, adults at risk, and finally, uh, premature outcomes. Now this is kind of a famous slide <coughs> from Borja Nordisgaard, and he's a prominent um, Danish lipidologist and geneticist, and he was the lead on a paper in the European Heart Journal about that really helped get FH kind of back on the map as an under-recognized condition. So in the Netherlands, where they have cascade screening based on genetic diagnosis, they estimate that about 70% of those in the country with FH have been diagnosed. And then Norway and Iceland and Switzerland, as you go down, you can see that detection rates fall off. It doesn't mean that people with high cholesterol aren't being picked up, but what's not happening is the recognition of the genetic diagnosis and screening of first-degree affected family members for recognizing the importance of early treatment. So you can be a heterozygote or you can be a homozygote. So heterozygotes have one bad gene and homozygotes tend to have uh, have two bad genes. They're really not often homozygous. They'll have, uh, they'll be what's called compound heterozygous, but both parents are affected. Generally, the mutations are in um, an allele of the LDL receptor in ApoB, which connects to the, I'll show you a cartoon of all this, ApoB that connects to the receptor of PCSK9, which regulates receptor function. These are in millimoles, because this is an international publication, but in adults, the LDL levels can be as high as 280 and higher. You can see physical findings of, of cholesterol, early heart disease onset, and they do respond to statins. Homozygotes will have usually two genes. There's something called autorecessive hypercholesterolemia. Their cholesterols can be up as from 400 to over 1,000. They will often have xanthomas or physical manifestations of cholesterol deposition. They can have heart disease and also aortic valve disease in kids, and they tend to be much more poorly responsive to drugs because of the genetic defects. Now, here's kind of the first interesting thing from an outcomes or population-based research standpoint, is in the old days, it was quite simple. You had one bad gene or two bad genes. If you had two bad genes, your numbers were really high. If you're one bad gene, your numbers were high. However, now that you know entire populations have been screened, um, what's been shown is that there's genetic overlap related to, um, to level of LDL cholesterol, which has created lots of problems. So if you get way up here, over 500, the vast majority of these people are homozygous FH. There's a form called receptor negative, which is the worst, receptor defective or a little lower. The LDR and ApoB or PCSK9, double heterozygous, are here. Compounds are up here. But you can see that these people begin to overlap with the severe heterozygous FH population. So if you decide you're going to call somebody a heterozygote, the question is, are they a heterozygote? And for example, now in the Amish population, they have a founder gene, an ApoB defect, so the ApoB doesn't plug into the receptor. And those homozygotes actually have total cholesterols in the three to 400 range because they're a milder uh, classification. So where does this begin to matter? So there are now drugs approved for homozygous FH, but without genetic characterization, you have no idea, you know, you're basically just calling somebody without knowing the genes. And because the risk is driven by the LDL level, heterozygous with very high cholesterols uh, may not be eligible for the genes or even though, not the genes, the new drugs, but they may be helped. So here, right away, becomes an issue in accurate diagnostic classification and access to drugs and things like that. So this is, right now, this is one of the most active areas of interest, is how do you actually diagnose, even though it seems very simple to diagnose FH, in fact, it gets very complicated because of the genetic heterogeneity. And then there's another layer of genetic, well, first let me just show you how this all plays out. So this is a liver cell, and here's an LDL receptor. 
can see that LDL is kind of fitting snugly into the receptor. And um, these little green things are the PCSK9, or this is actually LDL wrap, which works on the configuration. And PCSK9 also works to on the LDL to degrade it. So what happens is if these, the, if these receptors are screwed up, then or they don't come to the surface, you have a defect. If this particle can't bind, those are the ApoB defects. If PCSK9, which actually um, work, it gets kind of backwards and I never get it straight, but PCSK9 actually leads to increased LDL receptor degradation. So gain of functions in PCSK9 actually lead to uh, FH because there's less receptors that are working. And then any the LDL wrap is an example of a gene which screws up the configuration as well. So it's all these, that 80 to 90 percent are receptor defects and the rest of the others. Okay. So um, there's over a thousand mutations in the LDL receptor. If you're receptor null, that's the severe form receptor dysfunction, means you get a receptor but it doesn't work all that well. ApoB, that's the coming together. PCSK9 gain of function accelerates LDL receptor degradation, and the LDL wrap and others are much rarer. This is where it gets fun. So now, if you do, and there's now a confirmatory study, if you look at GWAS in very large cohorts, what you end up finding is at the extremes, and you have a big enough population, at the extremes, you have genes that have large effects but are rare, both for raising LDL cholesterol and for lowering LDL cholesterol. There's a loss of function, PCSK9 mutation, which actually leads to higher LDL cholesterol and lower rates of heart attacks. In between, however, are a whole slew of genes that are small effect but relatively common. And so then what's been discovered uh, in a couple of cohorts is that you can develop a gene score for these small effect genes. And if you have a high gene score, you can have an LDL cholesterol as high as someone with FH, heterozygous FH. So that it's not FH, but it's genetic, right? If you have a low gene score, you can obviously have, have much lower cholesterol, but become, it becomes, again, interesting because it then layers more complexity on top of the genetic diagnosis. And, um, and you can have people, and now, for example, like I've studied in my own patients where I've genotyped them, they've had the ApoB gene, which is mild, their total cholesterols are 350, which would make them heterozygous. It turns out that these twins have gene scores that are through the roof, and it's actually been published. Some of these studies have been done in FH, and they show that even in FH with a single gene defect, you can have much higher LDL cholesterol than you would have thought, or you can drive your LDL cholesterol down towards the normal level so you're not picked up. So again, this then leads to uh, the complexity and the importance of bigger data larger outcomes and thinking about how these genes interact with the population in terms of driving cholesterol. So this is kind of this giant guideline that was international guideline, which is truly not evidence-based. But again, thinking about outcomes research and the complexity of care for FH, in this, the idea behind this, this guideline was to be more comprehensive because when you leave the United States, what you find out a, a, a number of different things. A, a lot of care is much more centrally regulated. So, for example, if you go to Australia, doctors in Australia are compelled to say, well, how should we check for FH in kids? They actually have to go to the literature and figure out a treatment pathway and then approach the government and see if the government believes it's cost-saving. If the government believes it's cost-saving, then they'll let doctors do it. So what they need to do is prepare an entire, and in many countries where they've achieved FH recognition, what you have is this integrated, uh, organized care for FH, not in the U.S. So what are the elements? Well, <coughs> screening, index cases, what's the best way to screen? How reliable is diagnosis? What's the clinical assessment? Cascade screening, which we're going to get into a little bit more later, but cascade screening is you identify somebody with FH, then you go out and test all the first-degree relatives, case identification. You do genetic testing. 
and how do you do it and is it reliable? There's clinical management, there's uh, aggressive treatment for people who have very, very high cholesterol, over 300 with apheresis, or the newer drugs, and then you get into all the issues of clinical trials with newer drugs. And finally, organization of care. How do you get people to actually take care of these patients properly? So all of these things are actually covered in this international guideline, but again, the point I want to make is that a lot of these, once you get away from, oh, this is a genetic disease, all of a sudden, a lot of these kinds of components are things that fit into outcomes research strategies and are needed for translational research, and translational research, research will be valuable in improving the care of these patients. So um, what are the clinical recommendations right now? So if you actually have xanthoma or other physical findings, <coughs> you want to <coughs> make sure you identify a homozygote because they need to be treated right away. I'll present the U.S. guidelines in a minute, but internationally, <coughs> the idea is people should be picked up between the ages of 5 and 10. And then, uh, and again, this is something which varies a lot country to country based on the rules around genetic testing but you may be genetically tested for FH after a pathogenic variant has been identified in a parent or first degree relative. I, I actually test kids, uh, but when you go outside the US, there's lots of ethical constraints about um, the genetic testing. But again, genetic testing is something which is not, or this disease has not penetrated uh, the US very effectively. If you're going to screen, you want to use age, gender, and country-specific plasma LDL concentrations. An LDL over 5, which is about 200 millimoles or 190, uh, is a high probability of FH, and over 4, which is about 160. Um, if you have a strong, so just this level alone gets you FH. This level plus parental history of very high cholesterol or premature CBD makes it highly likely you'll have FH. And this data is actually based on genetic confirmation studies in the Netherlands and England. And actually, if you do cascade screening, you can lower the threshold a little bit. So um, internationally, there's a recommendation to identify, um, uh, offer uh, genetic testing to anybody you think is an index case. So as a phenotypic diagnosis, this, let's say, would be someone who comes in as a 25-year-old who has an MI and their cholesterol is 280. Um, you can go ahead and figure out if they have FH by genetic testing. Again, this hasn't really penetrated in the U.S. Uh, genetic testing, you need a CLIA laboratory. Um, and then uh, if you, there's a lot of non-pathogenic uh, variants, so that needs to be sorted out. And then... <clears throat> FH cannot be excluded if the clinical phenotype is strongly suggestive of FH. So again, I'm going to get back to this later. But again, about right now, if you look at people who think of FH by all the clinical criteria, about 10 to 20 percent are gene negative. So they may be undiscovered genes. Um, whole exome sequencing, which is a newer technology that's being applied to this, is starting to pick up some new genes. They could also have that polygenic inheritance. But again, the LDL is driving the risk. Um, and if you compare people who are gene negative with gene positive, they have some other different characteristics. But the point is that you have this now disjunction that's created by the genetic testing versus the clinical phenotype. So cascade screen. So what is that? So FH is actually a tier one uh, disorder for uh, identified for genetic screening in populations. So the breast cancer gene and the colon cancer gene are the other two genes that meet these kind of tier one criteria at the CDC. The problem is, is there is insufficient data on how to screen or the efficacy of cascade screening in the U.S. for the CDC to act on this recommendation. But initially, it's carried out in first degree relatives, and then you can extend it to second and third degree relatives. But basically. You identify someone as an index case you think is FH, you test them genetically, they're gene positive, and then you go out and get the relatives. Genetic testing makes cascade screen more cost effective. You could cascade off a clinical diagnosis because of the strong um, inheritance pattern. And in much of the world where this won't be, where genetic testing is not available, um, it's recognized that you would cascade off clinical diagnoses. 
Um, but you don't necessarily, you know, a question is do you actually need to gene test everybody? And let's say you have a, you identify a gene, let's say um, an adult, do you actually need to gene test everyone else in the family's cholesterol level is 350? Um, and then, uh, okay, once you have a gene, um, once you have a gene, um, once you have a positive gene, you don't need to worry about other kinds of scores that exist for telling you whether somebody has a gene. Now, um, this is an old slide, but it's been replicated now in the modern era. I just like to use this slide because it was done by Pete Quitterich, who's recently passed away. He's one of the kind of the founding fathers of pediatric lipidology. He's also done way back at NIH in that era in the 70s. And these are just cholesterol levels of the kids of uh, parents identify with FH. And you can see that there's a bimodal distribution of their cholesterol levels with the affected here, unaffected here. And actually, this is a relatively narrow window of overlap in these children. And at that time, cholesterol levels in the population were a little higher. But basically, this gray zone is between about 140 and about 170 milligrams per deciliter. This has been um, repeated now in the Netherlands with very similar results, except that um, the overlap goes down about as far as about 130. Now, if you try and screen in the US, what, what things happen. So this is actually a pretty novel study because instead of screening in a doctor's office, a friend of mine who has, has tried to get cholesterol measured in every kid in West Virginia. So uh, basically over about a decade, uh, he tested over 20,000 kids. This is about 60% of the kids uh, agreed to be tested in fifth grade. And about 71% actually met screening guidelines, which meant they had a parent with high cholesterol, a parent with premature MI, or they were obese. And about 29% did not. And what's interesting is that uh, as you track down through these groups, the likelihood of finding an LDL over 160, which would be in the FH category, was no different between the two groups. So in population-based screening, um, this family history criteria, what's called selective screening, didn't really work very well. And so cascade is much more rigorous because you're starting with a genetically defined index case and moving out. If you just rely on family history in a general population screening setting, it's actually pretty useless. So that actually gets back to the question of you just test everybody so you can pick everybody up, or do you rely on cascade as a way to screen uh, the population? And what age do you screen at? So this is a study done by a guy named David Wald. And what he did is looked at the relationship of age to the sensitivity and specificity of LDL cholesterol alone for getting a genetically defined hypercholesterolemia. So what you can see is that there's one age that outperforms both total cholesterol, both total cholesterol and LDL, and that's one to nine years of age. So if you screen somebody as a child, the likelihood, and they have an LDL cholesterol level above 160 milligrams per deciliter, the sensitivity and specificity of that LDL cholesterol alone is extremely high. And as you go up, newborns are second best, teenagers are third best, and then as you get down uh, to people who are over 60, uh, or certainly 40 to 59, LDL cholesterol alone, very poor screening tool for familial hypercholesterolemia. So again, the idea here, the data from here would suggest that early detection is important because as you get older, your cholesterol levels drift up. The other thing to remember is that if you have this genetic disorder, that you've been exposed to elevated LDL cholesterol over the lifespan. So if you compare an F, if you compare FH cohorts with non-FH cohorts as adults with the same level of cholesterol, the FH people have much more atherosclerosis than those who don't have FH. So they're under-recognized, and then they end up getting under-treated, and that's where that under-recognized issue uh, comes to play. Now, the other interesting thing, and David Wald, who did the other papers doing this in England right now, and I would love to do this here, but I couldn't get it off the ground, is suppose you identified kids with FH here, we know it's very easy, based on just lipid levels alone, to say, okay, 
and you can actually do phenotypic screening here if you wanted to. Uh, you can identify kids with FH, and then the LDL cholesterol can be used to discriminate those with FH and those without. And then you go back and get the parents and the siblings, and then you go out from there. So that probably will be the most precise uh, screening method, and you would identify lots of parents who um, may not even be, have their cholesterol tested or may not be aware that they need pharmacologic therapy, and you can have an impact not just on the kids, but on later generations. You can then go ahead and genotype the parents if you done the cascade based on the phenotype and identify, uh, you know, the gene that's causing the problem. Interestingly enough, my very first preventive cardiology paper was uh, on the very first 14 kids I ever saw who had high cholesterol, I measured the cholesterols of their parents and found 14 parents with FH, eight of whom which weren't being treated in 1986. It was my very first paper. It's like full circle. Anyway, in the U.S., what do we have? So um, we have developmentally integrated cholesterol screening. So we just, in 2011, we kind of bit the bullet and recommended that every kid at age 9 to 11 have a fasting lipid profile. Uh, this is largely because of the, uh, the re this is really developed for two reasons. A, I showed you why selective screening fails, but also, again, the, this idea of cascade had really not, this is, we were doing this 2008-2009, and the idea, whole idea of cascade was, in, now people talk about it, in 2008-2009, it was underwater. So, um, but another reason to test at this age is advanced, that we know that advanced atherosclerosis begins to develop in FH at this age, and we know that if you screen everybody, those who are over 160 have a high probability of having FH. And then, if you have positive family history or the risk factors, check cholesterol at about age two. Um, and these are the levels of, uh, that are based kind of on 75th and 92nd percentile distributions in the U.S. population. But if you're high on this guideline over 200, it'll be over 130. You're not going to miss anybody with FH based on the current uh, recommendations. Now, there's a huge backlash against cholesterol screening in kids. Um, and so what are the reasons behind that backlash? Well, the first is cost-benefit. So, again, a favorite outcome stock. Mm -hmm. So it turns out, if you have FH, the cost of treating your cholesterol is extraordinarily cost-efficient. So if I know you have FH and I go to treat you, it's somewhere between five um, $9,000 per life year. So, but, so the added cost is like if you do universal screening, if you do a cascade screening, how cost efficient is that? So, where the debate in the literature now is about the added cost of case identification. If you identify somebody, it's highly efficient to treat. Now, all these studies are done in adults, so the next question is what is the incremental benefit of identification at age 10 versus age 20, which was the previous universal screening uh, recommendation from the adult guidelines, or just over 20. If you're over 20, you should have your cholesterol check. Well, one reason is that virtually every kid in the United States goes to the doctor at age 10, whereas virtually no people at age 20 go to the doctor, right? Um, it implies also that screening should be done in a doctor's office, which maybe that shouldn't be done either. Um, but also, at this age, um, you can get kids enrolled. Uh, they actually have health insurance through their parents. It's easier to get them started and that kind of thing. How about the long-term side effects of statins? Well, right now, diabetes seems to be the most important one. Um, interestingly enough, um, there was just a recent study done in genetically confirmed FH that showed that people with FH actually have half the lifetime risk of diabetes as the general population. So there's some thought that there's something about this defect which actually is protective against diabetes. If you look at the adult literature, it's mostly people who are over 55 or 60 who have, are obese or have the metabolic syndrome type phenotype who go on to get diabetes. Of course, this was just confounded this morning because I had two uh, Southeast Asians in my clinic with FH and their father who's 45 and obese 
Typical Southeast Asian kind of thin muscular strength, big gut. He just got diabetes. <laughs> no, I'm trying to, yeah. If you're going to screen, would it be more effective to screen Canadians or would you screen everybody? Well, right now, what we know in the general population that there is yet to be, if you look at the newest GWAS analyses right now, the frequency is 1 to 200 to 100 to 220 in every population that's been studied. So actually, right now, in the latest genetic testing, there is, there's been no population tested by the most advanced techniques where the gene frequency is worse than 1 to 300. Now, there are genes, there are, there are populations where it's much more frequent, like certain French-Canadian founder populations, South Africa, whichever. So sure, there it's much more likely. However, the gene frequencies there are under 1 and 2 or 300. Um, so, another long term side effects of statins that people worry about. There are no real, I mean, basically, every statin trial in youth is without a signal. Um, and then, of course, people talk about the absence of long term trials with hard endpoints. Well, there's some data that suggests the drugs are highly effective. So, now I think you'd have to do the study for 70 years. Uh, <laughs> but, in any event, we'll get into that. So another key barrier, which I think uh, a key pro issue, which I think again falls into the outcomes research field, is uh, what are the barriers to implementing cholesterol screening? Well, the first is FH awareness. So now we do have an advocacy organization, but this is clearly a disease which is well below the radar um, in clinical perception. Physicians. There are a lot of physicians out there that, that don't believe they can prevent early atherogenesis. And then there's the time, skill, uh, and reimbursement involved uh, in, in not only identifying the patients, but getting them managed. For the family, you can have competing health issues, education level, financial resources to pay for the drugs, which if you have very severe FH becomes important because a lot of these drugs are in the cost range of over several hundred, over $100,000 a year, some of the newer drugs. And then privacy concerns related to uh, genetic testing. And then at the societal level, I talked about how in various countries, people who are FH advocate, advocates are working with their governments where they have, um, you know, um, policy or healthcare policy or treatment is driven by cost-benefit analyses. So cost relative importance to that particular country, publicity, and then the ability to get guidelines, support, and infrastructure um, all become pertinent issues in terms of whether or not you can identify people with FH. So how do we know early treatment is important? So this is done uh, kind of a classic slide by a friend of mine. And that was uh, Bert Wiegman who did the first statin trial in kids. But what he did, and again this is a design consideration, is he compared kids with their siblings for carotid IMT, which is a marker of early atherogenesis. And what he showed is that beginning at about age 10, actually there's a newer slide that goes down to age 6, that if you look at carotid IMT somewhere in this 8 to 12 year age range, the carotid IMT begins to increase in the affected versus the unaffected kids and becomes statistically higher um, by adolescents. So we know by this comparison of kids with their siblings that there's a difference in rate of atherosclerosis progression beginning um, in uh, late childhood or early adolescence. And then I did this back in the 90s. I took a group of my FH kids and ran them through a CT scanner. And so this is a 14-year-old with a cholesterol of 400 and some low HDL and father with an MI in his 20s who has coronary calcification in his left main. So and we found about 20-some percent uh, of, of these kids um, at coronary calcium, and that rate seems about right. I have unpublished data from MRIs that show about three out of ten kids we did. You can see a little bump in their descending aorta um, or a little small atheroma. So in this, we had 29 kids, seven had any calcium, and interestingly enough, BMI was a differentiator um, as to the likelihood of having calcium or not, because they both had both groups had very high LDL cholesterol. But you can see even this BMI, which is hardly earth-shattering today, uh, 25 versus 20, 
uh, led to a significantly higher likelihood of uh, having coronary calcium. Now, another um, key uh, innovation in the last few years is Mendelian randomization. I'm sure there's plenty of people in the room who know more about this than I do. However, what's important, what Mendelian randomization does is it takes people with known gene defects uh, in the population and compares uh, those people, you know, so they're identified because of high, this gene, and then they compare people without the gene, both for outcomes and in change of the risk marker. So what you look at, let's say somebody has a gene for high cholesterol, how much higher is their cholesterol than people who don't have the gene? And then what are their event rates and how do they compare? And how does that compare with known observational data? So uh, what are the advantages of Mendelian randomization? So it, this genetic variation may identify risk status. You can use low frequency high impact genes like FH, but you can also study high frequency small effect genes in the same way in a large enough population. It provides the rationale for benefit of lifelong low LDL cholesterol levels. So now that we know, and this has been done with many genes, including these high frequency small effect genes, and what we know is for every millimole per deciliter of LDL, which is 38 milligrams per deciliter, there's a 50% risk reduction, and it doesn't matter what the gene is. And this has now been done across a broad number of genes, um, and the results are highly consistent, that for every 40 milligrams per uh, deciliter of LDL, 50% risk reduction over the life, life course. Um, it overcomes many limitations of observational studies, providing more precise risk estimates, uh, particularly measurement variability and confounding from social variables. And also the results are highly consistent with clinical <coughs> trial data suggesting greater effect, longer and steeper LDL lowering uh, interventions. And the other thing, for Mendelian randomization, for example, this has been very important with the HDL triglyceride controversy because triglyceride genes um, actually seem to outperform the, the, the measurement of triglycerides in the population. HDL genes in Mendelian randomization have no effect. And we know that people with high triglycerides have low HDL, but also very high day-to-day -day variability. So things that are limitations in epi studies drop away a little bit in these Mendelian randomization studies. And also it's helped to kind of get LP little a kind of back on the radar. Um, so these kinds of estimates and results from clinical studies lead to these kinds of figures, and this is another figure which has become pretty famous. So people have developed this idea of what is your cumulative LDL lifetime cholesterol exposure that makes you likely to have a heart attack. And so if you don't have FH, people start getting heart attacks at about age 55. And if you're uh, a woman, you're protected, and if you smoke, have high blood pressure, etc., all this, you know, takes you down. Now, if you take a homozygote, with a very high cholesterol, you can reach this horizon early in adolescence. An untreated heterozygote gets there at about 35 years. If you start a high-dose statin at age 20, you can actually attenuate this, or actually in adulthood, you can, yeah, that's right, no, I'm sorry, age 20, you can attenuate this, but if you start a low-dose statin at age 10, you already have an impact on these cholesterol life years to the point that you may be able to start bringing the person over towards this uh, more typical horizon. Um, so in children, we begin with diet, which is typical uh, AHA diet. But here, um, this is one disease where I know people are controversy over fat and this and that. This is one disease where you don't want saturated fat in the diet because it's directly impacting uh, cholesterol. Um, you begin to think about drugs at age 8 to 10, uh, and then there are treatment goals in this. Now we know what diet does. This is the one of two randomized trials of diet intervention uh, in kids. And so this was an LDL diet intervention done now almost 30 years ago, the DISC study. What this showed was that diet works, but it doesn't, it only lowers your cholesterol about 3 to 5, so that's not going to treat FH. Now, these are, there's data from both England and from the Dutch as to the impact of statin treatment on event rates um, 
in um, in adults with FH. So the this is before the introduction of statins into the treatment of high cholesterol. These are event rates, cumulative event rates in follow-up within the Dutch clinics, and you can see by 12 and a half years that roughly 60% uh, of people have events. However, in the statin era, this was reduced to about 20%. Now, the British did something similar, but they also looked at the age at which these events were occurring. And so this is the pre-statin era, and this is the post-statin era. And you can see that the age groups in which the event rate reduction was the greatest was 20 to 39 and 40 to 59, with event rates 148 to 37, 367, 99 and in secondary prevention 2816 down to 436. So again, here is observational data, not very rigorous, but at least showing the impact of statins on a dramatic reduction in event rates in younger individuals. So now, again, the Dutch um, have done this. So these are, remember, uh, in the earliest pravastatin trial, um, where I showed you that carotid IMT slide, these kids have now been followed up, and now they're all age 30. So far, no kid in that study has had a heart attack. Their parents um, had already had 8% had already had events by the same age. So again, this is not a randomized trial, but the parents at least have the same gene, and this has just reached statistical significance at age 30. So we have some observational data as to the importance of, of statin treatment, but again, what's the quality of this design as evidence? So in children, uh, we um, you know we start with statins. It needs to be approved. Um, in homozygotes, all bets are off. You just treat as aggressively as you can. You're going to monitor the weight, growth, physical, and sexual development of being. You're going to monitor various safety parameters. And now, um, because you don't take statins during pregnancy, there's no gender difference in initiating medications because it's anticipated that uh, women will interrupt statin, statin treatment during pregnancy. We know, again, from the carotid IMT study that if you give kids a statin for two years, that they actually can have a mild reduction in carotid IMT versus the placebo controls who had a slight increase in carotid IMT over two years. So again, this is an events, but it shows some subclinical atherosclerosis improvement in those who were treated. Um, so now this is, um, actually now it's online, European Heart Journal. This is uh, the pediatric guideline that just came out for the European Atherosclerosis Society, which has um, European recommendations for what to do with FH. So basically, uh, if you have high cholesterol in a parent or high cholesterol in a child, that gets you into the algorithm. If it's in a parent, then you want to test the child. Um, and the parents should have genetic testing. Again, this is in Europe. In kids, if that LDL is over 160, uh, where screening has begun, for whatever reason you check it, whether it's cascade, whatever, then you end up, does the parent have a pathogenic FH mutation? If the answer is yes, you just run through the algorithm. If the kid has the mutation and the LDL is over 5, 3.5, then you start them into the treatment program. If there's no genetic testing, then you go through a, an algorithm. If the kid's over 190 or 5, have FH, if they're over 4, and the parent has high LDL or premature CHD, then also they're highly probable and they get into the clinical management. If the numbers are lower, then it's just. Um... So um, this leads to a lot of questions. Um, so, you know, where are the evidence gaps right now uh, in the field? So here are just some questions that are worth putting out there. One, are results of cholesterol-lowering trials in non-FH patients relevant? So I would argue that they're, that they're proof of concept for efficacy, and they may be helpful with regard to safety, but I don't think they tell the full story because FH patients, may, at any time they're recognized, may have more atherosclerosis than you anticipate. Uh, we know that the time gap between case identification and outcomes, particularly of treatment as effective, is large. I think this, at this point, ethically precludes randomized trials starting at a very young age uh, with outcomes, <coughs> and how will subclinical atherosclerosis measures fit into that. 
We know that treatments and ability to detect atherosclerosis are moving targets over time. So even in the last five years, there's three new classes of lipid-lowering drugs that have come online on the market and are involved in clinical trials right now. And our vascular measures to detect early atherosclerosis are improving, but they're hardly perfect and probably are not quite ready for prime time in trials and issues. And then um, the core question is, what is the relative benefit of treating to prevent atherosclerosis versus treating to prevent events? So I would argue that the fundamental difference between those who believe in early prevention versus those who would uh, await until you meet, fit into risk algorithms later in life are that, um, is that people who favor early treatment believe that atherosclerosis is actually the disease. If you don't get atherosclerosis, you'll never get an event. And if you treat earlier and keep your vessels as clean as possible as you get older, that's the most effective strategy. Whereas, um, you know, if, if events are ultimately downstream, and we know that 10 to 15 percent of people with FH, for example, don't end up with heart attacks, um, we have to really show that, you know, and also because of safety, cost, and all the other issues, is ultimately, is it ultimately event reduction which is important? So future research, I think we need to know a lot more about subclinical atherosclerosis imaging, both in terms of accuracy of identifying atherosclerosis, but also does it really predict events that can be used as a, as a legitimate outcome in studies. Um, we need trials showing event re reduction as a result of early intervention, but I think the study designs are, designs are going to have to be creative for the reasons we've already discussed. Long-term safety uh, needs to be established. Uh, value, cost effectiveness, and acceptability of universal and reverse, cat reverse cascade screening strategies in kids are essentially undone. And then I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of audit organization of care, community, and specialist settings to get better case identification. So the FH Foundation exists. It's been out there for about three or four years now. It has a very energetic leader. And they've done a tremendous amount for raising FH awareness nationwide um, and getting research off the ground. And more importantly, they have a registry now, which has over 2,000 people in it. Uh, we were the first to enroll a patient. It was funny. I was like number one for about like three months. And then the adult center is just like, now I'm down like to 25. <laughs> but anyway. Um, it's the only FH registry in the United States. Uh, it's a hybrid model with both patient and clinician enter data. It's run at Duke, the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Patients enroll via the website. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we're launched in the first quarter of 2014. First, now I use about <laughs> 20 sites. Uh, the idea is to get above 20 sites this year, but I think next year's push is going to be to get this out to the general public and get more people, family and people enrolling. So we're probably going to try and work through the ACC to get cardiologists proving recognition and getting uh, family and patient awareness and getting patients to enroll themselves as well. So to summarize, this is FH in the past, where you have genetic input, you have accelerated atherosclerosis, you don't really get treated, and then you have an event. The idea if you intervene in kids, you still have atherosclerosis as a child, maybe a little bit more as you grow up, but you get screened, your risk factors are measured, you start with lifestyle, you get drugs, and the disease progresses more slowly, and then later in life you can begin cascade screening of, well, you start cascade as soon as you're identified, but as you have your own kids or whatever, you can keep the cascade um, thing happening, and you may actually live to be 70 or 80. Sarah. So it's really fab really fabulous. Um, can you discuss a little bit on um, uh, the coming role of PCSK9 uh, uh, antibodies, especially their application? You know? Yeah, so uh, right now there's no clinical trials in kids. I think um, in FH they may certainly be broadly applicable, but I think you have to do um, genetic testing. So for example, I have two homozygotes. One is receptor null for both genes, so PCSK9s would not be effective. So I think 
if you look in adults, PCSK9 does have a modest effect in receptor null heterozygotes. It has a bigger effect across the board. Um, I just saw, this is completely unpublished data from Rob Hegley in Canada, but he had some really interesting data where he's able to compare people with FH to people with the polygenic inheritance. And what he's actually shown is that um, if your receptor null, that a lot of these drugs have the least impact. If you're receptor defective, they have a little more impact. If you're polygenic, they have a huge impact. So what's interesting is even though we know the drug response in FH and you get about a little bit bigger bump with statins if you're receptor defective than receptor null, interestingly enough, the, these drugs still don't work as well as they will in the general population. So I think my suspicion is if the cost is affordable, the PCSK9 drugs will be broadly applicable. There will be pediatric trials getting underway. But I think it also highlights the possibility of, of personalized medicine, precision medicine, uh, for the future with these various drugs and their mechanisms. So, so the, with the difference in mechanisms between statins and the PCSK9 antibodies, do you see them having different applicability in different genetic groups? I think that that's kind of the next frontier. I think it'd be really interesting to see. I think I think for the general population they're going to be broadly applicable. But I think we're going to I the more I do genetic testing, the happier I am that I do it because I've yet to measure. I've now done about 15 people, and I've yet to find not find interesting information. Something I didn't know before. I've now done gene scores in two people. Uh, and I've done the conventional FH testing and the rest. And both people I did the gene scores in, I was really glad I did them. So one was, the, well, actually two were these twins with ApoB defects who have LDL levels more than 100 above what you'd expect. The other one was a kid who presented with a total cholesterol of 500 and triglycerides of like 1,500. And it turned out that he had was a type 3, E2, E2, heterozygote for hepatic lipase, and had triglyceride and cholesterol LDL gene scores through the roof, both. So I know what he has, you know? So now I know exactly what the kid has. I know his diagnosis down to the nitty gritty, right? What's interesting about that kid, he's actually very responsive. If he loses weight and exercises, the numbers go through the floor, you know? And so you would predict his responsiveness by his genotype. It's fat and sits around, and does nothing. You know, and also, he, and he also has had an exaggerated response to the statins, which we predicted by what Rob Hegley says that he's observed in his, you know, the people he's doing this complete panel testing on now. He's been doing it for about a year and a half in Canada. So, so I think it's pretty interesting. I don't think we really know the answer. We're not going to know the answer unless we collect the data. And the more I do it, the more convinced I am that the genetic testing is useful because. I mean, you know the diagnosis. And it, it actually, in the cost analysis, it comes out as next to nothing. So, you know, it, it used to cost 2500 now it's under 1000 You get the whole exome sequencing, you know, with new machines, it may cost less. We'll so, carry a chip in our bucket. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Better than a chip on your shoulder. We've already, <laughs> already got that. Um, <laughs> do you, Sam, do you have any idea uh, what Portion of children in our community are getting screened. Well, they're actually at Nemours. It's going to be a quality. Their quality initiative for next year is going to be to implement oh. screening in the practices. So actually, what I want to talk to Bill about is a, a study that would compare. There's a, I think it's $500. You can buy a little machine to put in your office that measures cholesterol. So the question is, what I would like to do is randomized practices to this machine versus just giving them a lab slip and um, see what the yields are. I think right now the current estimate is somewhere between 5 and 20 percent of U.S. children are getting their cholesterol measured. Uh, it was pretty flat and hadn't been impacted by any guidelines from about 1992 through the, about 2011-2012, but there's, I just saw some data last week where there's a signal that it's definitely starting to go up and starting to get mainstream. So it, it's increasing. It's probably below 20 percent. Yes. I really enjoyed your talk. I was thinking about perioperative implications. So sure. Your typical P's anesthesiologist in the absence of P 
five piece on that one, like left coronary artery type. Thinking about ischemic heart disease, right, uh, and, and stroke, right, and so with these kinds, and they don't instinctively go hunting, right, for these things unless they're clues out in the universe. Yeah. So if you're doing this, um, my question number one is, what kind of guidance, perioperative guidance, are you giving? Anesthesiologist. Well, the other ones are really a risk or homozygotes. So I make them aware that this is an adult case. So I actually we just put an apheresis port in an eight-year-old last week. So I had to give this guidance. And uh, this patient also already also has aortic stenosis. So mm -hmm. this girl I know from Echo has goobers right around her corner. So. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we did it with cardiac anesthesia, and they were aware she could have an MI. Um, so in a homozygous situation, I think heterozygotes highly unlikely. I know of one patient, and basically it kicks in in the 20s or 30s. I know of one kid, a litigation case I was involved with about 20 years ago, who dropped it playing basketball and probably had FH, but his cholesterol actually, his LDL was actually under 190, the treatment guidelines. So, so that's, you know, that's an anecdotal case. I, I think. So FH, FH treated, I think, at a young age isn't an issue at all. So uh, I think that what's, what I like about FH is that it's just this wonderful model for thinking about a lot of the other stuff you think about in terms of outcomes, the genetic implications, small genes, big genes, acceptance, parent involvement, PCORI type research uh, in terms of these FH is the FH advocacy group got the registry off the ground, not the docs. Um, I mean, they're the people who did it. You know, we were involved, but helped design it. But it was the advocacy group that got the registry off the ground. Um, so a lot of the things that are involved in PCORI, rare disease research, population-based research, fallacies in in applying outcomes to people with genetic diseases, all these things that we think about. FH has something to say about, you know, health disparities, costs, it's all there. Thank you.